Africa, the cradle of civilization and ancestral homeland of all people of African descent. During the transatlantic Arab and European slave trade nearly 500 years ago, enslaved Africans were kidnapped and sold into slavery. Some 66 trading posts were built along the Gold Coast of West Africa, and 32 of these trading posts, or slave castles, were built in today's Ghana. It is estimated that 25 to 100 million Africans were enslaved and scattered throughout the diaspora, which consists of North America, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, and Asia. African Americans have long had an awareness of their African roots and many have retained a deep spiritual and physical connection to their African motherland. This connection has been and continues to be a very important part of African Americans' true sense of self and identity and their desire for freedom and self-determination. Today, over 5,000 African Americans are living in Ghana, West Africa. This film will give you a glimpse of how African Americans living in Ghana today describe what motivated them to reconnect with their homeland, Africa. How do African Americans living in Ghana see themselves? First and foremost, I'm a child of the creator whose ancestors were born in Africa in the loins of my ancestors who came to America and we were born, were we still not Africans? We may not have known where we came from because the slave trade was such a horrific experience. So we don't know. But we do know that we came out of a nation of, of black people, of African people. So, my position is that wherever it is that I set my foot, wherever it is that the spirit leads me and says, this is where you are, that's where I'm supposed to be. That's why I'm here. That's why my husband and I are here, because the spirit said, this is where you belong. What attracted you to Africa and Ghana in particular? There's something that I felt was missing, a part of me that I felt was left, was here in Africa, that I needed to come back and to feel complete. Yes. This is where I belong. What made you feel um, The people, the, the atmosphere, my spirit, uh, it was just a combination of things. My love for Africa and for Ghana in particular, in such ways that it overwhelmed me. You know. I love the spirit that's here. It is the motherland. It is a land of beauty. It is a land of vast potential. Uh, it is a land where my soul has found rest. And I, um, I love the land, I love the people, and I love the experience. Uh, more often than not, and we spoke about it, people do not see the bright side of Mother Africa. Um, we were lied to in America about what Africa was, a land of jungles and people being savages and being a dark continent. We see the famine, we see the starvation, we see the civil wars and ethnic conflict. But what we do not see is that beautiful, healthy, elegant smile of the African and uh, the Ghanaian. Um, those of us in our village life and the peace of the village. Those of us on our farms and growing our own food and raising our own cattle. Um, those um, cities that we have built and doing commerce. Um, the personal relationships, the everyday personal relationships and mothers carrying their babies on their back and um, fathers going to toil and um, actually our own people running a government, black people being in charge of themselves and their own destiny. And it's the beauty of all of that that basically has kept me here and makes me not have a single regret for having made this decision and living here for almost 16 years. I would add this, my mother's um, mother 
loved Africa. My mother tells me the story, or she told me the story. God bless her soul, she's with the ancestors now. But she told me the story of her as a young girl with her mother, watching her mother, who um, used to listen to, to Emperor Haile Selassie mm. on the radio every week. And she would tune in the radio, put up the Ethiopian flag, and put his picture there, and listen to him give his talks. And just be in tears, always wanting to come here. So I came here with my mother in 1994. So we fulfilled, we thought, we felt that we were fulfilling grandma or her mother's dream and desire to come back. What are some misconceptions most Americans have about living in Africa? Well, I just say like overall, not really just Ghana, but Africa, because that's how people put it um, when we're in America. Um, what they see in the media there, they don't see the shopping malls or the big houses or like, you know, big cars. And then a lot of times when people come here, they're shocked, like, oh, well, people have a lot of nice cars here. Or people have nice houses. People, they don't understand that, you know, there is poverty here, of course. No one's going to say that it's perfect. But there are people who live normal, modern lives here as well. I, like many African Americans who come this way, uh, came with rose-colored glasses on. You know, we, when we start learning about Africa and our connection, you know, those are our brothers and sisters, and they're really going to be glad to see us when we get there. It's like, welcome home. Right. And, um, but I have an expression, and it may not be my expression, it could be someplace somewhere I heard it, but a quaba does not always mean welcome. Though a quaba does mean welcome, but a quaba does not always mean welcome. And I met people who smiled at us, you know, or said that they were happy to see us and cheated us out of our money. The thing is that the number of African Americans that I've seen that come here that have attempted to build houses, uh, probably 80% of them have been duped out of their money uh, a couple of times because they were not, didn't, wasn't fortunate enough to, to run into the right individuals. And of course, you know, there's bad people all over the world. Uh, they say it's only two or three bad people in the world. The problem is they move around a lot. So, <laughs> but we have to deal with the bad and the, and the good everywhere we're at. I know that you hear a lot of stories about, you know, you come to the country and people are going to try to take advantage of you. And, and that does happen. I'm not trying to say that it doesn't. But I think that the biggest thing that people, especially if you're you know, African-American or wherever else in the diaspora, and you choose to come to this country or any African country, you should come for the land. The land connects you to the ancestors. The ancestors will then connect you to the people. Don't come with open arms trying to go directly to the people. Because the truth is, is that the economics of this country is there's a lot of people who don't have. And you can't blame people who don't have for trying to have. And it's, it's just the process of it. And so, but I've realized that when you come for the land and you take the route that I said, the land to the ancestors, to the people, then people, it, it becomes more of a spiritual guiding, more of a spiritual connection. And you have, people see the genuineness of that. Oh, I guess uh, the, the good thing that I've, that I, and I just recently learned to appreciate this, uh, with the recent election that went on here, uh, it was a very close race, you know, almost as close as uh, Gore and Bush, if not closer. And the beauty of is that the people are genuine. They've had so much war, so much fighting, so much coup, that they finally realized the value of life. And to have an election that close, there wasn't even one fight that started. You know, there were a couple of heated uh, arguments, but not one rock was thrown, not one bow and arrow was pulled out. So that's saying a lot, that to be at this level right now, and as an African country, I mean, it means a lot, because in most African countries, up until this recent election, an election this close, there are going to be at least 50, 100, 100 people going to die as a result of conflict and debate going on. So. 
I mean, it's good to see that. The other thing that I appreciate is the work ethic of the people. You know, a lot of things are still done manually here. And so you realize that these guys, when the work is there, and the unemployment rate is extremely high. But most people want to work. They have a strong work ethic. And, of course, women are the hardest working individuals in the country. And you could probably say that in most countries. But in particular here, women will carry the heavy load, and, and they do a majority of the work. And they still got to take care of the kids, and they still do a lot of the cooking. But I, I've been more inspired. I have nine sisters, so I'm not too surprised with the strength and, and uh, the ability and intelligence of, of women. What cultural differences need to be understood? It kind of distresses me a little bit is the fact that everybody wants to leave. All of them, so many Ghanaians want to leave and go to America, England, Italy. They don't care. They just want to get the hell out of Ghana. And we're like ships in the night. We're doing this, you know, we're passing each other like ships in the night, neither knowing nor caring. And um, there are different ethnic groups, and as opposed to tribe, because I don't particularly like that term tribe. Tribe is what the Europeans call us, you know, this tribe, that tribe. But ethnic groups, we're, we're from different ethnic groups, and um, the African born in America is a different ethnic group than the Africans born in Ghana. And even in Ghana, you've got so many other ethnic groups within that Ghanaian community. Uh, it's still a male-dominated society, okay? So a lot of African-American women that I've seen come over here that are well-educated and independent and, you know, can read you perfectly in the U.S. and put you in your place with their intelligence. Here, that you can't really, you know, move forward too fast that. You have to pick your time because you know, standing toe to toe with some men, and definitely if they're a chief or even close to that status, and trying to argue some points, uh, you just won't get as far. And a lot of times you'll get ignored. And it's sad to say that you stand a better chance if you go find some man to help convey your point across, because the guy will listen longer, instead of uh, listening to a woman. It's unfortunate, but we're still in that, that type of environment uh, right now here. Many of our brothers and sisters here do not hear us well, as well as we don't hear them. Right. Okay. And so because it's, a, it's a learning process. It's, on both it's sides. a educational process. Yes. That's on both sides. Okay. Uh, but the food, I've been used to the food before, you know. And we have chicken, we have fish, we have rice. Uh, we have fufu, you know, uh, so I don't have no problems with that, okay? okay. okay. Uh, the customs I have been able to adjust to, the language I have a hard time. I think in my enslavement over there, they cut my tongue out to be able to speak my language. You know, I can hear it, but I can't speak it. You know, I know other people come here in 15 minutes, they are speaking. Mm -hmm. But I, I know everything else. Even when I get sick with the malaria bug, I take the medicine that is traditional here, and that's the nim tree. Yeah. And it's bitter. And I, I, I've even asked my wife, I said, how come everybody don't take it? And they said they can't stand it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you remember when you're coming up there, cast your oil and so forth and so on? Yeah, yeah. Hey, but this NIM, I swear by it. Yeah, it works. It, it works. What surprised you about Ghana and for its people? I was a little surprised and disappointed, you know, people calling me white man, oh Bruni, yeah, oh Bruni. <laughs> and I said, well, why are they calling me a white man? But then I began to understand and some elders, I mean, I met a lot of really wonderful people who brought me to a different level of overstanding. They said, oh Bruni really meant he who has come from beyond the horizon. Didn't we come from beyond the horizon? 
And if you call me a white man, it wasn't because my skin was white. It was because I sounded like a white man. But my, as I said, what do you expect? I was born in a white man's country. I went to a white man's school. I learned the white man's language, all right? And other than speaking um, Ebonics, that was the only other language that I had. So, but not, once I got over that, once I took off those rose colored glasses, it was like being in America. People are people are people. Well, you think you'll come to see an authentic African, uh, some things they, with the Western names, you know, I come here hoping to hear their, West, their African name, but they tell you a Af uh, Western name. To see the, the women not knowing how beautiful they are, perming their hair, uh, what you call whitening their skin, uh, so many things were disheartening like that that they didn't know how beautiful they are and embrace it and know how unique their own culture is and treasure it. That's very surprising to me, yes. They want to be me, it seems, and I want to be them. <laughs> they want to be Western and I want to be the, the African, you know, totally. You know, as an American, people just automatically assume that you're rich that you got enough money to solve all of their problems, all of their need, and every time they ask you for money, that you should give it to them. The thing that people just expect so much more from you as an American, because you hear, hey, where's, where are the other African Americans? Why aren't you guys rushing over here to help us out, you know, bringing your new technology from the West, new companies? And uh, it's a myth. All the things that they've seen, all the rules that apply to uh, you know, individuals that they see in all of the white American films, their lifestyle and all of that, they think African Americans live that same lifestyle and that you have plenty. So you should share, share more with me. What I learned about Ghana and surprising is this. People have a tendency to believe that Ghanaians in general are very enlightened on pan-Africanism, etc. What I came to know, and I speak to you as a Ghanaian, not as some foreigner, I speak to you as a Ghanaian. It is that Nkrumah was like a big shade tree in the hot desert, and everybody was trying to get under the tree to get out of the sun. That was the legacy. But we got the wrong understanding that Ghanaians were touched through, in and out with Pan-Africanism. And that's what shocked me. So I come to see him as a big, it was Nkrumah. He was like a big shade tree, and they all were just getting under to get out of the sun. You understand my point? The other one is, shocked me is to know that they don't know, they think that America produced indigenous uh, Americans who happen to have black skin. They had no, no knowledge of the fact of the slave trade. They knew, they touched upon it, but they couldn't see us as being descendants of their forebears going there. They saw us then, and many do now, or you're American. Oh, and they truly mean that you are an indigenous American. America has real white looking, and you know, but you are, you are Bruni as well. Were there things that disappointed you about Ghana and or its people? The biggest surprise that I've had is to watch the evolution of the Ghanaian spirit, the Ghanaian hospitality become more and more westernized, which is not what I saw when I first came. Well, I'll use my first teaching experience as an example. Having come from Detroit, from the Detroit public school system, I was um, waiting for the children to become um, a bit unsettled, uh, disrespectful, uh, disorderly, and whatnot. And so there they sat. And when I would enter the door, they would immediately jump up and say, good morning, mom. And uh, they were just, for three weeks, 
I was just kind of confused as to when will these children act up? <laughs> because that's what I was used to. But they never did. They never did. They, they remained so respectful. And so the children today, since I'm still in education, are very different from those children in 73. And I think it's because of television and videos. Um, the children used to wear uniforms to school. They still do. But when they went home, they put on their cloth. And now they, they have to have on something Western. Case in point, when I opened the school and started interviewing, finally got a staff together. I said, one of the things you're going to have to do is wear Ghanaian clothes to school every day. You wear your cloth. Four of the sisters said they didn't have any. I said, you don't own one piece of cloth? They said, no. And I asked them why. They have here what they call a bend down boutique. You know what that is? Anyway, <laughs> a bend down boutique is um, they put the used clothes on the ground. So you bend down to select what you want to wear. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they call it the bend down boutique. Yeah. But their thing was it was cheaper to buy these used clothes and wear them than to buy a piece of cloth. For the price of a piece of cloth, they could have four or five outfits. And I told them that was not an excuse. So they all wear Ghanaian cloth now to school. But those are just some of the changes that have come, come about. Mm -hmm. Probably, uh, well, as far as the government areas go, the frustration and waiting a long time, uh, they can't multitask. So if you go someplace, somebody's out to lunch, somebody's traveled, and nobody's there to take their place. And I have situations in my life right now like that, you know, regarding immigration, regarding the land, you know, can't find anybody, you know. That's about it. As far as the people go, the disappointment I find uh, is that many of them or what I call survival mode, you know, to, to eat from day to day is hard. Mm -hmm. Even though they manage and they, they, there's a nation of hustlers and I, I admire them. Yeah. Everybody who will, in the city when the car stops and they run up, you know, with coconuts, with all kinds of food, all kinds of stuff, hoping to get a sale, you know, yeah. it's very, very difficult, you know, for me to understand, you know, not to understand, but to accept. So what I do as a businessman is every time I see opportunity, uh, I try to make a difference. You know, I have two people now that we're about to make African dolls. You know, that would help them more than help me. You know, so I'm trying to help them. Thanks. Why did you leave America to live in Ghana? Growing up as a child and watching the civil rights movement as a child and seeing my people beaten and dogs chasing after them, seeing them fighting for rights to be a, a whole citizen over there. I don't know, you grow up with that and you know that something's not right. I used to stay angry, man. Yes. <laughs> you know, I was the typical angry black man. You know, the typical angry black man. They say, oh, you're just an angry black man. I say, you're right. Why? Why was I angry? because I didn't feel like I fit in. I, I was, no, I knew I didn't was, fit in. wasn't good enough. I used, I used to go to work in suit and tie every day, briefcase. <laughs> and white folk would be afraid of me. I'm like, there's nothing I can do to keep you from being afraid of me. So if you're afraid of me, you must need to be afraid of me. Right. You know, you <laughs> should be afraid of me. There's a reason. There's a reason for you to be afraid of me because I'm trying to do everything I can for you not to be afraid. I'm, I'm wearing a suit, I'm wearing a tie, got a nice haircut. But you're still afraid, so you, there must be a reason. <laughs> if you accept all of that stuff that they show you on television, telling you how you're supposed to act, who you're supposed to be, how you're supposed to feel, how you're supposed to look, 
and you don't meet any of those things, where does that put you? That puts you outside. And, and an I'm yeah. a, uh, yeah, I'm an oddball. Something's wrong with me. And mm. I didn't think it was anything wrong with me. I started to think so. I didn't I thought, think it was. I, at the point, I started to think I was crazy. Yeah, I, I didn't think it was anything wrong with me. Yeah. I knew it was not the place for me. And when she said uh, she was Jamaican, I said, well, hell, let's go to Jamaica. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get the hell out of here, man. I'm part of uh, the Hebrew Israelite community in Africa. Um, I left America um, with the idea of, of living in the promised land of Africa. I believe in the teaching of Martin Luther King when he said we as a people would get to the promised land. And the promised land to me is Africa. So I came and I have been blessed to live successfully, not without challenges, but I have gone, I consider from rags to riches. Within 23 years, I live uh, in a house that's paid for, three bedrooms, I have a couple of rental properties, 50 acres of farmland, and I'm helping to um, bring good food to the tables of our people at home and abroad. Primarily, the Spirit of God is the motivator. Uh, biblical prophecy was the stimulator because being a Hebrew Israelite, and we are Hebrew Israelites, and we um, understand prophecy. And the prophecies of the Old Testament state that uh, after 400 years of enslavement, that Almighty God would begin to stir us again to want to come back to the land of our ancestors, and that he would begin to uh, open a way for us to come back mm -hmm. to the land that he scattered us from, which uh, in particularly was Ghana, West Africa, because uh, most, though, most of those who were enslaved, most Africans enslaved, came through the forts and the dungeons of West Africa because, in Ghana rather, West Africa, because Ghana has 40 to 50 of those forts. Um, most of them are concentrated here, so we know for a fact that we came through here. So this would be the place to return. It's, it's a freedom. My spirit is free. And I don't know how to explain that to anybody. It's just difficult. You know, it's like I've been stuffed in a bottle and the, the cock popped when I came. And you can breathe. Now you can be you. I used to um, tell people all the time, it's kind of like uh, being uh, a squishy toy and you're squeezed down and fit into some kind of a shape. And no matter who you are or what you achieve, where you go in the U.S., you're still that squishy toy <laughs> squeezed into some box, some shape. Living in Nigeria, I was loose, I was free. And um, that, I know, had an impact on how I saw myself and also how I interacted with others. So even when we returned to the US, even white people said, you know, you're different. And I realized I had become comfortable in my own skin. And um, that was an experience that I didn't want to give up. What keeps you here in Ghana? It's a blessing to be in the tropics. Sunshine, food grow year round. And of course, we're building. I'm not here alone. There are other brothers and sisters that are moving to Africa. The biggest joy, and I can really say that joy that I find about Ghana is early in the morning, you really hear the world come alive, and it's a completely different experience than I've heard anywhere. And I've traveled around a lot, and from everywhere, from the goats, to the birds chirping, to the roosters, I swear, it seems like they're all competing to who can make the loudest noise at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, so that's um, one of the biggest things that I love about the country. You can't describe the feeling to people until, until they come and they have to experience it themselves. It's a oneness that you find nowhere else. 
Well, for me, it's a little bit different. I am a Jamaican by birth. And this is the closest to Jamaica. There is um, a stronger spirituality here that you don't get in the state. There is more than a, a connectiveness. There is a feel of oneness. Yeah. You know, and when you walk in the street, you don't have to feel discriminated. Yes. You go to the store, you have to wonder if you've been watched. And that, that's so, that make a big difference. There's such a peace there that you, you know, that I haven't found anywhere else, okay? And I love the people. And I love the fact that I can feel free. You know, there's a, such a feeling of freedom here. How has living in Ghana changed your life? What I learned about myself is that I really grow when I'm around people that are that are different from me. Um, it's it's hard to describe just the um, the, the energy and um, just the, the knowledge you gain from seeing how other people live, seeing how other people struggle, seeing how other people um, deal with the challenges that face in life under a totally different setting than what we experience in the States. And I felt like it, uh, it allowed me to just really connect with um, what's really important about life. You know, that six month experience I had uh, in Africa before I moved to Ghana. Um, it, just, it just changed my life. And, and after that trip, I knew that moving to Ghana was, was definitely um, something that I was going to make sure it happened. So. I've learned to appreciate um, and value uh, more um, from an African perspective, which I feel is more holistic. You know, coming out of America, whether you profess to be or not, we come out of a capitalist society where we focus mainly on the individual and individual achievement. And I personally have learned more of that collective, communal, village, um, whole unit self appreciation and value system. And I've learned to appreciate that more. I've learned to put in perspective um, material um, value versus human value. And um, I've learned to appreciate that development and that growth in myself. And it's brought me more of an inner peace. I don't feel that I am in conflict like I was in the U.S. I feel that I am in a peacefulness and a comfort zone that is very hard to explain. And as a black man growing up in America, it's almost like we feel no matter what your status is and accomplishments that you are in um, a constant state of conflict competition. and competition. And it's the removal of that element of competition that I found that sense of peace within myself. And that is what I've enjoyed more than anything else. I'm home. I feel in my spirit, soul, and body just feels good. Feels good here. I have um, the house at the ocean. I have a house aside from the guest house where I can go and relax and face in the ocean. Could I get that in America? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think it would be out of my reach financially. Um, so I'm home. That's all I can say. I feel home the rest of my life. The rest of my life. My health has gotten better. <clears throat> I've lost a few pounds. I, I went to Norway and um, I was exercising a lot. But when I came here and started, my diet changed. You lost about 45 pounds. Yeah, I've lost a lot of weight. <laughs> um, my blood pressure has gone down. Uh, you have on blood pressure, cholesterol medicine? My cholesterol has gone down. Um, my knee has stopped hurting me. Uh, I still have a few aches and pains, but, you know, um, for, the, for the most part, I'm, I'm a lot healthier. Um, what else? Uh, the question emotionally. Um, emotionally, I'm more at peace. There's hardly anything that upsets me because 
I, I don't know, I feel free. I, I, there's almost nothing that upsets me. What is it like for young people to live in Ghana? Well, the first time was in 2001, and my family decided to move here from America. And we'd never been here before, my mom, my brother, and I. So it was a bit of a culture shock when we actually did land. So being only 14, I wasn't really favorable of the environment. So I wanted to leave. It was just different. It was, you know, everything that we're used to was very limited extremely limited at the time. I mean, now it's much different. You know, you can find a lot more things. Things are much more modern now. But in 2001, it was much different here. It was very, very, very much a third world environment, which if you haven't visited before, it's a bit of a, a very big change for you. The environment here has changed. And now I'm more f mature, so I can accept a lot of things that at the time I couldn't. So, it's, and now, I mean, now I'm here by choice because I could just be working in America, but I chose to come here for business reasons because it's a very robust environment and things are new here and pretty much any ideas can work. Like young nightlife can be very exciting here. Um, there's lots of places to go. There's lots of things to do. Um, there's clubs, there's lounges, there's the beach, there's the movies. And now they have the mall and the movies, which they didn't have when I first came here. My children are secure about who they are in a way I never was, despite all of the um, living in a household with a Garveyite <laughs> and all the different exposures that my parents were able to give, give me. Um, they have a way, they're like world citizens. There's no place they can't go, there's nothing they can't do, there's no group they can't be comfortable with. They're just very grounded, very secure, very sophisticated citizens of, of citizens of the world. And, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, there's the more, I guess, uh, mundane issues of the fact that they have been able to attend some of the finest schools in the world, or the fine, you know, one of the finest schools in the world right here in Ghana. But the teachers are African, the students are majority African, you know, so they're in a place where everybody around them not only looks like them, but it's a, they, they have grown up in an environment where everybody wants the best for them, which again is different for us. Our families may have loved us, but then we had to go out the door in and America, yeah. in America. Yeah. But for them, you know, the, the driver, the nanny, the lady that sells vegetables on the corner, the, the, the teacher, I mean, everybody wants the best for them. And so, you know, that definitely impacts your, you know, your self-esteem and, and, uh, your ability to, to, to move in the world. So, I mean, I'm, I have some wonderful children. They will perhaps take exception to me calling them that. And now that my son is out there, you know, at university in America, and I see the kinds of things he's done, the choices he's made, of course, his academic achievements. I mean, I, we are tickled to, to death and very proud of both of them and believe that growing up in this environment was very key to uh, who they have, you know, turned out to be, yeah. How do African Americans contribute to the development of Ghana? Well, I feel uh, one of the things I know that we're contributing to is one, good health, I mean, by providing uh, good, clean water, uh, we're able to touch the lives of many people. And that's significant. You know, dirty water is the cause of most disease. And so to know that we're providing that, we do 100,000 gallons of water a day. That's what we sell. And like I say, every day I'm running out by 430. So we're, we're having that impact. Uh, having 265 employees, I'm having a direct impact on 265 families. And if my business wasn't here for them to work for, they may not be working at all. 
and each one of my employees have at least five to ten other family members that are dependent on that income. And on average, my average employee makes maybe about $100 a month, and he's working six days a week, and he's happy to be there. So we, we're, we've made that direct impact uh, on the community and uh, as a whole. And of course, we've grown. It's caused us to be more understanding. We have to be more tolerant. One of the things I think uh, is uh, the health issue. We have a small clinic in a village called Quapro. And we service anywhere from 30 to 65 people a day. We're only open four hours a day. Uh, the majority of the cases are malaria. But our medical officer is able to catch it so that the children or the adults don't become completely devastated from it. So I would say health-wise, our clinic has done a lot to save lives. I'm in the process of trying to build a birthing center next to the clinic, what? a birthing center, because the women in the village have to walk down this long, long road to get to the main road to get a taxi to take them somewhere uh, to deliver. So if they wait to the last minute, uh, they're in trouble. We have one baby born in the clinic whose name incidentally is Malkia. <laughs> His name is what? Malkia. Malkia. Yeah. They named the baby after me because it was born in the clinic. But health-wise, I think we've contributed a lot. As I said, our church fellowship chapel helps to support the clinic. But we also employ six people there, so economically, um, we are helping them and their families. Here we employ 14, 15 people. Uh, we pay all their salaries. Our parents find it very difficult to pay tuition, so we have to take our personal money at least nine months out of the year. We go year round to school. So at least nine months out of the year, we have to pay the salary. So economically, again. Educationally, of course, we're trying to help our Ghanaian children understand that our African-American children were all the same. So they have to study African and African-American history, and along with the other things that, that we teach them. Mm -hmm. Well, we have about six hotels, uh, a restaurant, a rooftop bar, um, and my son is currently going to do a, a, an adult and entertainment club. Um, we just opened a, a, a video store. Um, I don't even know what you would call it. It's, it's like private uh, movie theaters. You have your private rooms where you can go, you can bring a party or, you know, like if you have a group of friends and you want to watch a certain movie, you have your own room, surround sound. It's, um, it's quite a few different business. A lot, a lot of work, a lot of work. They're all in Accra. Um, and um, we have, a, the, most of them are in Achimota. But the, we have two here, and uh, two different businesses here in East Legon. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's spreading out. I just hope it doesn't go any further. I can't keep going to all these different places. Is there a support group to assist those interested in repatriating to Ghana? I think uh, the African American Association, which I'm involved with, can be an excellent support group for people. Um, we have people who have been here, who were invited by Kwame Nkrumah, who have been here since the, the uh, mid-50s, all the way to somebody that just got here a month ago. Uh, you have people who are married to Ghanaians and who have, you know, you know they're, they're second or third generation here. Mm -hmm. um, you have people who, you know, African-Americans, couples who are here, families who are here, retirees who are here. 
people who are in big business, people who are in small businesses, people who are professionals, doctors, nurses. So we have a wide representative range of people and experiences and reasons for being here. So I think that uh, the African American Association is a wonderful starting point to, uh, to get information, and that's before you come, or before you decide to come permanently at least. <laughs> yeah, me, Nana, Cohane, those of us who've done it. Up here at Cape Coast. Cape Coast, even our crowd. What I'd say to anyone that's coming, that the first thing you need to do is that you need to reach out for your own ethnic group. You need to reach out to people who have done what it is that you're proposing to do, okay? I'm not saying that you should not go to Ghanaians for assistance or not take them on as friends and things like that. You, you should, but you need to come to people who have done what you are attempting to do. Having come from that side is different when you're here doing it, but having come from that side. You're gonna make your mistakes. We're not, you know, oh, Yo, you're the authority? Well, kinda, sorta. But I can't tell you how to run your life, how to do, run your business. All I'm trying to do is to maybe help you not to fall into the same holes. You'll have your own holes that you'll fall in, trust me. You'll find some, they won't be like ours, but to you know, kind of smooth the way and just put something in your ear. Now, if you don't want to pay attention, that's entirely up to you. But that's what we ought to be doing. Yeah. My job, my husband's job was to be able to, we were to be here to show people how it was possible to do this. So our home has always been open. People come here all the time, oh, can I go in the house? Sure. We want you to walk through so we can show you what we've done. Not to be braggadocious, but to be able to say, you know, we come, we're show me people. Is that, yeah, right, show me, okay, yeah. Yeah, you said, uh, yeah. Well, we're show me people. So as show me people, then um, that's what we're here to do. Are there any provisions for dual citizenship? I know for, for us in particular, we were here when they enacted the right of abode law. Um, and in fact, my husband was on an advisory, he's a lawyer by profession. So he was on a little, he was on an advisory uh, in preparing the legislative instrument. So we were excited about that provision. Uh, but here we are, 10 years down the line, we believe fine, upstanding citizens. We've contributed immensely to this country, uh, brought money, brought jobs, raised kids, uh, have uh, involved in philanthropic, yeah, created businesses, involved in philanthropic works. We applied for right of a vote and were rejected. <laughs> and um, to our knowledge, no African from the diaspora has been, no African American has been granted right of a vote, which is extremely disappointing. Extremely disappointing. A kith, you're my kin. And then on the other hand, treat me like a foreigner, okay? Um, the law changed that gave Ghanaians dual citizenship. We did not get dual citizenship, even though President Jerry Rollins um, came to us in America and courted us and said that dual citizenship would be granted. Others have said we would get dual citizenship. The Joseph Project, which I thought, and it really was, was a tourism gimmick because that said that anyone who came during that period would get a Sankofa stamp in their passport and they would no longer have to pay visa fees to get into the country. Find me one person with a Sankofa stamp in their passport, and I'll eat your hat, okay? It's not there. So <clears throat> we still have not um, gotten dual citizenship. And see, some people feel that they need it. They consider that they're, they're protected if they have that. I don't really feel like that. I mean, I can live anywhere in the world that I want. I can live anywhere in Africa that I want to, okay? And I'm not going someplace where it's not safe. But I do feel that as long as I've lived in Africa, as much as we have contributed 
to the growth and development of Africa, um, whether it's educating children, employing people, all the money I spend in this country, I spend in this country. I don't send to America for things that I need for the most part. This is my Mac, okay. Uh, but I'll well, get my Mac coming out of America because they don't have them over here. But for the most part, everything that I get, everything that we've ever bought, we buy in Ghana. Car, furniture, you name it. So I'm investing, I, all of us who have come to Ghana are investing. So why won't you grant us citizenship? So now the Ghanaians say that it's not them, but it's the United States because the United States doesn't recognize dual citizenship. That's a crock of crap, okay? Because the Italians, the Chinese, the Pekingese, the Taiwanese, the Gunganese, everybody can get it, except Africans born in America. So our fight, and I'm gonna call it our fight, because I don't want people to think, oh, you, say, you, know, you hear me say me, my, us. Well, yeah, it's we, okay? Our fight is against whomever is preventing us from having dual citizenship. There's nothing in place that facilitates the return of Africans from the diaspora. And the um, political language is, oh, my brothers and sisters, come home, this is your home. And uh, come back and relocate, help us build a nation, help us build a continent. And that's there and it's good. But there is nothing that is in place that helps to facilitate that in terms of identifying us as a group and saying that we have this in place for those who are returning from the diaspora. Um, from the government side? From the government side. From the government side legislatively. There's no dual citizenship law. Um, there's no law that facilitates our residency outside of the normal um, process that any foreigner goes through. So the facilities that we have available to us um, are the same as any German or Frenchman or Englishman um, with no, um, no amenities that say this is your home when you're returning. We understand that um, there's been a long gap since our return back here, but we feel and we're advocating those of us that are here that the government should be more sensitive to this large constituency of its family that are outside looking back to Mother Africa, you know, for a relationship, a real bona fide family relationship. And that's not an onus on Ghana alone. That's an onus on every African nation on the African continent. And we're advocating it from that perspective with the AU. We're asking that every member state of the AU would adopt the policy that facilitates the anticipated return of Africans from the diaspora. And not to wait until they got a cluster of them who ran into problems and then began to be reactionary because of those problems. But they should anticipate that Africans will choose to come home and not everyone will come to Ghana. And as being a government on this continent of Africa, anticipating that some brothers and sisters may identify them as their home, they should put into place policy that facilitates that return. Why should African Americans visit or repatriate to Africa? You know, on the sidelines of America, that we have choices and we have alternatives, and that the sky is still the limit. We impose our own limitations on us, but we're not limited by the gifts that the Creator has put in us because He's endowed us with the greatest gifts that can be given to the human soul and being, and that we need to exercise those gifts to their fullest potential, and that Africa should be on our list of choices and alternatives, and that you can fulfill yourself and become whole by returning back here to Africa. If not to come here to live, come and receive the other half of yourself so you can be whole and do what you have to do in your life and with your destiny wherever you choose to do it. But you can never be whole and never be complete with Mother Africa not being a part of yourself and your agenda. So come and, and, and get the other half of yourself. Brother Malcolm X told us in one of his lectures over 40 years ago to those of us who felt that um, we don't have nothing to do with Africa. And I ain't leave nothing in Africa. He said, why you left your mind in Africa? You need to go back and get it. So I say, come and get the other half of your mind back in Africa so you can be your total and complete self. Did I lose my mind? <laughs> yeah, I lost it in America. I found it in Ghana, you know, so everything is cool. So the only thing I can say to people is step out there and do it, okay? You know, jump in, the water's fine, all right? And don't come beat me up if your stuff don't work. When you come to Africa, you come with your eyes open and your ears open, okay? To erase that, what I call the Afro-Saxon blindness over your eyes. Understand that this is, like I said, this is not New York City. You know, things don't get done quick, quick. That this is the building ground for the future of our race, 
okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have to understand that. To bring something to the table. I would say to anyone who is considering this, that the first thing that you want to do is that you want to visit first. Um, whether it be Ghana or any other African country that you're considering returning to or repatriating to. And that first, first you visit, okay? You need to visit once, maybe twice. Some people fall immediately in love and like, that's it, I'm out. Because I've had a few people have come here like that. They call on the phone, one day, hi, I just want to know what's going on. I got to get out of America. What do I have to do? I, I, I can't stand it. I said, okay, fine, let me help you. And I think, you know, fine, they'll be here next month, a couple of months. Two weeks later, they're coming through the gate. Hi, it's me. Well, what are you doing here? So I told you I had to get out. Um, but seriously, we need to also have a plan to show up, to say, okay, I'm here to live with no plan, no money, no idea of what you're going to do or where you're going to do it at. It's not a very smart thing to do, okay? Um, you will be easily your money will go quickly. Not just because someone's going to steal it, but because it's going to be quite costed. So you need to have an idea in terms of what it is that you're going to do. It's not easy, okay? As this is my book. It says, returning home ain't easy, but it sure is a blessing. And it's true. I've got 310 pages of it ain't easy. I mean, a lot of laughter, a lot of challenges. And I don't choose to call them troubles because they weren't, but they were challenges. And being ready to rise to the occasion to meet the challenges, you need to have a sense of humor. And you gotta have a lot of patience. And you need to leave your rose-colored glasses in America, because this ain't America, okay? And though, and even though it's not America, it has so much to offer us, but we in turn have to give a lot of ourselves to it and it will make it it'll work for us you know people ask me well you know what is it that you you love about being here and how could you just give up america to be here how's no mortgage no rent no car note no credit card bills no creditors at my door i pay water lights and you know i run a business so I have to pay my staff salary and things like that. You know, we have a, a wonderful guest house, a great piece of paradise. But it, it's a business, all right? But all those other things that make us stress ourselves out of our minds, um, being a paycheck away from homeless, I don't, we don't have that here. This is your invitation to come and be your authentic self. Africa is home. You're an African born in America. And your, your inheritance is here. Your birthright is here. And you should come and get it. Come and get it. It won't be easy, but it's not easy in America either. And the, the struggle has a pot of gold at the end. <laughs> it has um, just peace and joy and, and your own space. It's so nice, it's so nice. Come and get it. For these African Americans, the reconnection with the motherland is an undeniable physical and spiritual experience that seems life-changing. For those of you on a personal quest to discover your place in this world and to live an authentic life, consider reconnecting to your roots and make a personal visit to your motherland.